Um, I am Inga Mehrani. I'm the National Project Coordinator for the Adnet Memory Clinics Initiative, and I have the great honour to chair the 11th webinar in this session or in this series today. And today's webinar will be um, presented by Professor Maria Fiatarona Singh and Professor Victoria Flood. Um, and they will talk about can exercise and nutrition promote cognitive resilience and reduce the risk of dementia? So I'd like to start by acknowledge uh, the country we're uh, meeting on today. The Australian Dementia Network acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing con connection to land, sea and community. I'm today welcoming you from Daruk country and we pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, their cultures and to their elders past, present and emerging. For those that might join today for the first time, I remind you that ADNET is actually short for the Australian Dementia Network, which comprises three main initiatives. They are all interrelated and working together to improve the diagnostic treatment and care for um, people with dementia across Australia. So you see a little graphic how we all work together there on the screen. If you want to know more about all the individual um, initiatives, please join us on the Australian Dementia Network website where you find lots of information about all our projects. While I have you here, I also want to ask you if you've considered participating in the ADNET registry. If you're a clinician, work in a clinic that is diagnosing people with dementia, this is something we really ask you to consider and get in touch with the registry team. They're always happy to join up new clinics. Um, the ultimate goal of the registry will be to get coverage from all of Australia, every single person ever diagnosed with dementia should go into this registry as the long-term goal. So uh, sign up now, that would be fantastic. If your clinic is not already listed on our Adnet clinic locator, please also get in touch with us and use this red cap link or um, contact us in the memory clinics team and we will be very happy to list your clinical service on our Dementia Assessment Service Clinic Locator as well. Now I have the great honour to introduce today's speakers to you. We have Dr. Professor Victoria Flood presenting first to you. Professor Flood has a background in nutrition science, dietetics, epidemiology and public health. Her areas of research include population-based cohort studies and clinical trials to reduce chronic disease. Her main research areas include nutrition and aging, neurodegenerative diseases, eye disease, disability, micronutrient research, and food security of vulnerable population groups. Vicky has published over 200 peer-reviewed papers and is supervising several research students. She's also the president-elect for the Nutrition Society of Australia. And Vicky is very passionate about applying research into the clinical context and translating research into practice. And we're very grateful that she's sharing some of her work with us today. Our second presenter for today will be Professor Maria Fiatarona Singh. Professor Fiatarona Singh is a geriatrician whose research, clinical and teaching career has focused on the integration of medicine, exercise, physiology and nutrition as a means to improve health status and quality of life across the lifespan. She's holding the inaugural John Sutton Chair of Exercise and Sports Science in the Faculty of Health Sciences and the professorship at the Sydney Medical School at the University of Sydney since 1999. Moreover, she has continuing appointment as a senior research associate at Harvard affiliate Hebrew Institute for Aging Research since 1987. The focus of Maria's work over the past 35 years has been the prevention and treatment of sarcopenia and its clinical sequela in older adults, in particular both physical and cognitive frailty with anabolic exercise, high intensity progressive resistance training and other lifestyle interventions. And she will share with us some of her amazing work today as well. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thank you so much for inviting um, me to speak to the, the network group today. Lovely to be here online with you all. Um, I thought I'd open with this, this photograph from um, a local community garden at Wentworthville where they have a terrific bunch 
of people coming together from community and growing their own local veggies together. And you'll see the significance of the dark green leafy vegetables as I go along with this presentation. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm meeting on today. That is Bundjalung Nation in Northern New South Wales and pay my respects to um, elders past, present and emerging. And today I'm going to be talking to you from a very practical standpoint around um, healthy diets and cognition. I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to Mediterranean diet and anti-inflammatory diets and um, and some of uh, a brief overview of some of the evidence in relation to nutrition and cognitive function and some tips for putting this into practice and some things that you might share uh, with um, clients and patients that you're seeing, but also things that you might build into your own healthy lifestyle. Uh, this is a photo of a, a recipe that we're using in an online um, liver disease study where we're looking at inflammatory, anti-inflammatory diets and inflammatory markers and liver function. Um, this is one of the ones that I share at the end of this session. So if you look at this um, map of the world and you look at these, fat, these different locations across the world, you'll see, um, you might think about what might be common about those areas, and you probably may have already come across this, and these are sometimes referred to as the blue zones. And the thing that is um, in common about those locations is that many people who live in those locations live to a long, healthy life. In particular, they have a large proportion of people who live to 100 years. Um, and so it's interesting to reflect what it is about from the ecological standpoint, what it is about those locations and about what they're doing that may support that long, healthy lifespan. And so you, this schema gives you a bit of an idea about what are some of the common elements and what are the, the factors in, in each of the different locations. In that, that, that area of the US, they have a large proportion of people from um, who are practicing um, Seventh-day Adventists and they follow a whole grain, high soy consumption, no alcohol. Um, and, and then you, on, ongoingly, you can see in Okinawa uh, populations, they also have a high soy consumption. They, uh, they use a lot of turmeric in their, um, their food cuisines. And then in Sardinia, Italy, they have, use a lot of legumes, whole grains, nuts. And the common factors are really worth investigating and sort of unpacking a bit more. Um, so they, um, all of those um, areas have a religious faith. They work um, quite closely in family, in connectedness, in, in community. They're non-smokers. They follow a plant-based diet and they have even Mediterranean diet style in the, or an anti-inflammatory way of, of eating and plenty of legumes. A, quite a bit of purposeful, moderate physical activity among the population groups and a large proportion of social engagement. So it's just interesting to reflect on those types of communities from an ecological standpoint. And then I would just like to take you to Mediterranean diets and just to reflect a little bit what that is and what we know about Mediterranean diets and cognition. So um, the old ways diet period bit is one way of thinking about Mediterranean diets. Um, and in that, there's an emphasis on being physically active, enjoying time with other people, um, having plenty of whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts, extra virgin olive oil, a moderate amounts of fish and seafood, a smaller amounts of poultry, cheese and eggs. And UNESCO has identified the Mediterranean diet as an intangible cultural heritage and um, the NHMRC Dietary Guidelines has also recognised as the healthiest diet pattern in the world, one of the healthiest diet patterns in the world and re in relation to its, low, its uh, risk for you know, low morbidity and low mortality. And if you want to unpack that further, we actually published, Maria and I self, with a, a great um, previous PhD student, Sue Red Vaginus, a paper that explored all the elements of and described um, comprehensively all the elements of Mediterranean diets and cuisine um, in the Asia Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition a few years ago. So it's worth having a read of that if you're interested in that topic. So onto the evidence. We, we know that um, from observation research, for, so research that has um, described populations over time and monitored them over time with collected information about cognitive function, about diets, that we see that people who follow a more closely adhere to a Mediterranean diet um, type of eating 
have a lower, have reduced um, rates of cognitive decline compared to those who are in the, the, the less likely to have Mediterranean diet. And there's another type of diet called DASH diets, uh, which is similar in healthy eating pattern as well. And they see the same type of, um, of uh, lower, sl slower rates of cognitive decline. So that's observation research. I'm going to just quickly turn you now to some intervention research. And this was based on the PREDIMED trial that was largely set up for people who had cardiovascular disease risk. You might have heard of this. It was a big private um, RCT trial that was conducted in Spain. A large number of people participated. Uh, originally, uh, almost 7,500 people participated, and they had um, either type 2 diabetes or um, three of the following um, criteria to participate. And they then um, were given instructions randomly to receive either Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, and they actually gave um, bottles of extra virgin olive oil to participants. They were given instructions and lots of information, recipes and support around Mediterranean diet and nuts. And again, they were similarly given the product and or a lower fat diet. It was currently, but that, at the time, that was the that was what was being um, provided as as um, a support for um, reducing cardiovascular disease. They were, were followed up for a long period of time and then they looked to see how much they had of a cardiovascular disease event. And indeed, those people who were following the Mediterranean diet, nuts or Mediterranean diet and not extra virgin olive oil, had about a 30% redu reduced risk of uh, developing a primary endpoint like heart attack, stroke or death from cardiovascular disease related to cardiovascular disease. That was published in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. As a spin-off of that trial, there was a subset study that was um, uh, where they assessed cognitive decline in a, about 500 people. And they also received those, those same types of diet, Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, Mediterranean diets, nuts, and the control diet. And so about 100, 130 people over a four-year period of follow-up. They did cognitive tests and baseline at baseline and then began a follow-up. And you can see from this, um, this little snippet of the graph from, figure from that trial, they um, showed that people who were having the Mediterranean diet and extra virgin olive oil and the lighter bar compared to those on the control diet were less likely to have a lower score, frontal cognition scores, and less likely to have a lower score in global scores. And that was significantly different. And, and also the nuts group will had a higher um, composite score compared to the mem to the control diet as well. So that was from a randomized controlled trial as, as opposed to a, a cohort study. And uh, um, a few years ago, um, Again, with that um, same PhD student, we published a systematic review in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition around Mediterranean diet and um, function, cognitive function. And this particular RCT was one of the winners, was, was a standout in relation to that overall systematic review. So when it's well-conducted RCTs, we see the um, positive effect in, uh, in reducing function, um, cognitive function. So it's worth thinking about what it is about Mediterranean diet. There's lots of words on this thing, but I've broken it down to describe what are the food components of Mediterranean diet, what are the key nutrients that's providing, and how does that impact on health? This is very much a summary of um, these core components, extra virgin olive oil and its anti-inflammatory effect has very high concentrations of phenolic compounds. And it's worth looking out for really good high quality extra virgin olive oil that's only recently freshly been produced. Uh, it's not one of those ones that gets better over time. It's better to eat it and consume it when it's fresh. Um, you know, the nuts, uh, it's improved lipids, it's an antioxidant. It, um, you, particular nuts, particularly from walnuts, can elongate to um, in, in the body to produce long chain omega 3 fatty acids. And of course, they're also found in fish. Dark green leafy vegetables, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, are very important components of Mediterranean diets, as are legumes 
help support good gut health, high fibre, uh, improves cholesterol, improves insulin response, as does a very common feature of extra of, of Mediterranean diet is combining lemon juice and vine or vinegar with extra virgin olive oil as a dressing. And, um, and that also in terms of some evidence around reducing glycemic index and reducing likelihood of insulin resistance. Have plenty of, of clear fluids, water, herbal teas, um, good for hydration, no added sugar. And it's the cooking methods with the moist cooking methods that are shown to reduce inflammation. Now, I've talked a bit about inflammation in talking about Mediterranean diets, and you sort of saw me sort of almost use them interchangeably, those terms. But of course, Mediterranean diets tends to be you know, a, a traditional diet around the Mediterranean. It's worth looking at what are the other um, healthy diets across the world. And this very helpful uh, review paper was published a couple of years ago um, in Biomedicine. And they're described where we see pro-inflammatory diets commonly consumed in Western diets of, of Northern America, in some parts of Europe, but then they show where there are anti-inflammatory diets commonly consumed across the world. And I mentioned previously some of the, the Japanese, Asian type diets, um, ones that we see that are predominantly soy-based, and um, even in parts of the Nordic where they have plenty of whole grains and local fish and fruits and vegetables as an example of anti-inflammatory diets worldwide. There's been some more interest in exploring this concept of anti-inflammatory inflammation and anti-inflammatory diets. And this is an example of a cohort study where they looked longitudinally of a population in Greece and had about a thousand people aged in their 70s. And they looked at their likelihood of consuming a, a pro-inflammatory diet versus a, a lower inflammatory diet. And those people who had the highest fertile of the of the high of the of the pro-inflammatory diet, so they're more likely to have a high inflammatory diet, they were three times at risk of developing dementia over the three years. So at the beginning, they didn't have any dementia cases. So they looked for incident cases of dementia compared to those who had no uh, that were in the lowest fertile of the um of the pro-inflammatory diets so basically more pro-inflammatory diets versus less inflammatory diets so that was an interesting um study that was published only last year in neurology and we're interested to explore what it is about you know pro-inflammatory versus like diets versus anti-inflammatory diets it's probably not any one thing just like i explained in the mediterranean diet elements probably not any one factor that's important for good brain function and for good health of the body overall. Um, so there is this is the hypothesis that the mechanism might work like this, that low-grade inflammation from those pro-inflammatory diets increases the T-cell response, in increases the cytokines and interleukins. Um, and with these inflammatory markers that, that, that we are measuring currently in a, in a liver disease study, but um, also of interest in, um, in brain health. Um, and and, and in, by reverse, those that are having an anti-inflammatory diet uh, have less inflammation. So uh, I just want to unpack that a little bit more, but one or two more examples, and then I will um, pass it over to you soon, Maria. Um, and so in this particular study, they, this is an animal study where they gave the guinea pigs a high-fat diet and induced um, high, a very high cholesterol response. And in half the guinea pigs, they gave them a lutein supplement. Lutein is a carotenoid that's very rich in dark green leafy vegetables, hence my dark green leafy vegetables um, message. And, um, and they found that the guinea pigs who received the dark green um, leafy vegetable equivalent, the lutein, they were they had a reduction in the um, in the inflammatory markers of TNF and interleukin 1B and MCP1. And they also had improved um, liver function and eye function. Of course, lutein is very important for good eye health. And just to unpack that a little bit further, there has also been a systematic review on the importance of lutein um, in brain health. And in that, that was of RCTs and cohort studies where they'd measured a range of, of battery of cognitive function scales, but they'd also measure um, other elements of cognition as well from a physical perspective. So uh, just to give you a few practical examples of what are pro-inflammatory foods, what that might look like in your typical diet and versus what could you do to 
uh, as an alternative, anti-inflammatory alternative. So take your water crackers and camembert cheese, think about having whole grain crisp bread and hummus. Um, looking for alternatives to rice, uh, introducing brown rice, quinoa, frica. So I've got a recipe at the end that I share, which is we use frica a bit at home, and you've got to look for it in around it, at your health food stores or, or certain parts of your of your supermarket, you can find those alternatives. Um, of course, using extra virgin olive oil, oil is really paramount, having um, plenty of that in, in really liberally in your diet. And I have had um, a bit of a, a veggie salad with a lemon juice and olive oil mix on it um, today. And, yeah, that's always good. Um, in terms of uh, alternatives to iceberg lettuce, we know iceberg lettuce is super expensive at the moment. This is a really good excuse to actually try some alternatives, dark leafy vegetables as alternative. And, um, and you can look for fresh fruits that are brightly coloured, that, that really deep um, purple colours like blueberries are terrific. Um, looking at nuts as an alternative, potato crisp, looking at your whole grains and sourdoughs as alternative to, to white bread. Um, we, as I mentioned, we're doing a study of this um, in liver function in um, West, Western Sydney LHD, and we've we've come up with, you know, these are the anti-inflammatory foods that we're supporting people and asking people to consume to avoid having the pro-inflammatory foods, such as alcohol and refined carbohydrates, processed meats, and then it's got, got a little couple of recipes at the end. So this is a recipe that comes from um, our, our colleague, Dr. Sue Radabaginus, and she's, um, uh, this is a variation on it from her book, Food as Medicine. And lots, of, and you'll see there that recipe includes a really bright salad. It's a good summertime salad, this one, with papaya, which is high in carotenoids, lots of fresh herbs in it, um, and nuts as well, and avocado. So it's a really tasty recipe. You always get lots of good um, yeah, comments from these people when I have this recipe. And then I just also want to, this is one of the, the Frica recipes that we're using in our study of um, liver function. And uh, I find with Frica, a good idea not to overcook it, just be careful there. And that helps, that little bit of crunch helps it to um, maintain a, a, a lower GI level as well. And it's got a Greek yogurt um, sort of dressing with it and pomegranate. I just do a little promo myself here this is for one of my um, PhD students, Ashley. She's doing a study of uh, asking people who are age 55 and over around behaviour change and what they know about Mediterranean diet and whether they're interested in changing it. If you could take a little snapshot of that, that QR code, that would be terrific. We're just wanting to we just have a few people to, to do the survey. And I'll finish up there uh, with a shot there from my garden, um, sustainable food choices and the beautiful Northern Rivers morning sunshine rise shot. Part of would lead nicely into Maria's talk, who's going to talk to us about the importance of exercise. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thank you for the lovely introduction and um, thank you, Vicky. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is um, how to promote resilience with uh, exercise which obviously goes hand in hand with good nutrition, but we'll focus on exercise for this talk. So what I'd like to go over um, briefly is, what is the evidence that exercise can prevent cognitive decline in dementia? Um, does it affect brain structure or improve cognition? Uh, how does it work? And what kind of exercise is best and how might we apply it in ourselves and our patients? Um, so I think just to begin, I'd like to mention that exercise really has a role throughout the lifespan. And as you'll see, even, probably before that age zero there, um, uh, there is evidence that exercise is, is incredibly important for brain development and aging. So we'll talk about um, the ways that you can think about using exercise as primary, secondary, or tertiary prevention if people have already developed dementia. And I think for a lot of you who work in the dementia clinics, you're obviously seeing people who have already developed cognitive decline in dementia, uh, and you might wonder why we're talking about prevention, but all of those people potentially have children and grandchildren who might be at risk of dementia because of genetic or familial factors. So speaking to the families of your patients about what they can do to hopefully prevent cognitive decline is equally important to treating your own patients. So I think all of you are aware of the Lancet Commission and what they've identified as risk factors for dementia. And uh, in addition to the ones that were uh, previously identified in 2017, which you can see there, three new factors were added in 2020, excessive alcohol, head injury, and air pollution. So if you look at that, this list of factors, um, it, except for air pollution, education, and hearing impairment, 
um, the rest of these factors to actually have something to do with exercise uh, in terms of either preventing or treating people with these risk factors. So that means that exercise as a single treatment is actually a very broad spectrum therapeutic tool that you might use. It doesn't just change your physical fitness. It actually addresses each one of these uh, risk factors. So I, I won't show you all the evidence for that, but that, that is the case. And even more interesting, there are a lot of emerging risk factors that the Lancet Commission also identified, which you can see on the slide here. And again, every single one of these emerging risk factors for which there is some evidence, but perhaps not as strong, is something that has been shown in both epidemiological and randomized controlled trial literature to be related to physical activity or exercise. So even again, a broader stroke in terms of what might be the potential pathways by which exercise could affect cognition. Uh, and because there are so many of these potential pathways, there's never gonna be a single way that exercise works. And it's much like diet in that way. Um, there are thousands of, um, as Vicki would say, anti-inflammatory um, products that come out of, of the healthful diets. And we're never gonna identify a single sort of bullet that actually is the way that it works. So exercise is very, similar in that way. And when we look at all the risk factors, there is this kind of consolidation of cardiovascular and cardiometabolic risk factors, which um, not only are risk factors, obviously, for heart disease, but also are risk factors for dementia. So all of these are risk factors, not only for um, vascular dementia, but also for Alzheimer's type dementia, which, again, the two most common forms of dementia. And exercise, nicely enough, um, is, in fact, along with healthy diet, stopping smoking, reducing stress, reducing alcohol, social support, and pharmacologic management um, is part of the management strategy for all of these conditions. Um, so that's really kind of the basis. Um, how does it work? Well, probably there is this final common pathway that a lot of these cardiometabolic conditions will go through that potentially lead to dementia, which includes things like oxidative stress, insulin resistance, adiposity, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, um, and subcortical vascular disease. And again, you can see the crossover here between diet and exercise. A lot of these same risk factors for cognition are helped by both a healthful diet as well as exercise. So what does exercise actually do? There has been interest in, in particularly in the hippocampus, the area of the brain that, as you know, is involved with memory and memory impairment. And some of the earliest work actually looked at this area of the brain and found that um, just epidemiologically in cross-sectional studies, people who were more fit aerobically had larger hippocampi. So that was some of the initial evidence that suggested that there was something about being physically fit that was potentially related to a more healthful structure of the brain. But we do know that cardiorespiratory fitness is about half to do with your lifestyle and about half to do with genetics. So this kind of study doesn't really show you that being physically active will make your hippocampi grow. It just shows you that for whatever reason, people who are more fit aerobically also have bigger brains in this particular relevant area. And on the other side of the coin, the other kind of fitness we think about, which is muscular strength, um, also a lot of epidemiological data, excuse me, data now is beginning to show that there is a relationship between muscle strength and cognitive decline. And this is from the Rush Aging Project, looking at people between the ages of 80 and 86, and the ones that are in the lowest 10th percentile of muscle strength, for whatever reason, again, partially genetic, partially lifestyle, had a much steeper rate of decline in cognition over those six years than the people who were the strongest, who had almost no decline going from age 80 to 86. And if we look at who developed dementia in that same study, you can see that the strongest people um, had only about a 5% chance of developing dementia, whereas the weakest people were up more sort of 25% by age 86, so very uh, different kinds of profiles depending on how much muscular strength. And in other studies, muscle mass has the same kind of relationship with cognitive decline. So those are just studies about fitness and brain structure and function. What about physical activity itself? That's a different sort of question. And for that, we look to epidemiological literature about what, is, what do people um, do in terms of their cognitive health and their physical activity patterns. And what we see is that if you look at people who are in uh, the highest tertile of physical activity compared to people who are less physically active in these observational studies, there's about a 35% reduction in risk of cognitive decline. 
in the most active versus the least active people. So you can see the variety of studies there, most of them uh, independently significant and overall obviously highly um, significantly uh, reduced risk of cognitive decline. And if you look at dementia, you see the same sort of pattern about an 18% reduction in risk of actual dementia in people who are physically active compared to people who are more sedentary. So that's the epidemiological um, relationship there. So from these kinds of um, studies, we can see that higher fitness or physical activity are both related to better brain volumes, uh, as well as uh, activation and, and decreased risk of dementia and cognitive decline. Higher muscle mass is also related to greater brain volume uh, and higher muscle strength in the rush aging study, as I showed you, they're related to the lower rate of cognitive impairment and risk of dementia. So how does that all work? Well, probably many, many different cardiometabolic risk factors are operative in terms of reducing that risk of dementia and causing neural adaptations in people who are physically active. Uh, and so because of the multiple factors involved, we need a lot more experimental evidence to try and figure out uh, how actually is it working and what are the optimal modalities, dosages, and underlying pathways for these relationships. So that's epidemiology, but obviously we're more interested in experimental studies uh, like the PREDIMED study that Vicky talked about. Um, can you really change what people do and change their trajectory of cognitive decline? Uh, and for that, we need to look across different cohorts, healthy adults, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia to see what the evidence shows us. So one of the first, and the first study that actually did an experiment to look at does aerobic exercise change brain structure uh, was a study by Cole, Coleman and Kramer, uh, 2006. And they actually showed that six months of aerobic exercise to healthy older adults improved areas of the brain. It wasn't the hippocampus, which they thought it might be, but it was actually other areas of the anterior cingulate cortex uh, structures, which actually improved in size over six months compared to the control group who did just a stretching uh, placebo exercise um, paradigm. So that was the first study that showed that you could actually take people, randomize them to aerobic exercise and change the structure of their brain. In this study, they didn't measure cognition, or at least they didn't report it. So we don't really know whether that change in cognition, uh, whether a change in cognition was associated with that improvement in brain structure. So lots of other studies since that time have actually looked at that question. Um, and in this particular uh, meta-analysis, they looked at whether or not aerobic exercise improved cognition. And again, people who were healthy to begin with. So these are not people with any cognitive decline. Um, manifesting. And what they showed in this um, uh, study, in this meta-analysis, was that for executive function, for example, um, there was a significant, although you can see if you look at the effect size, 0.12 it would be what we would call negligible and yet statistically significant improvement in executive function in people who were randomized to aerobic exercise. So remember, these people are cognitively healthy. So there's probably a bit of a ceiling effect here. If you're already cognitively normal, it's hard to get super normal, um, but they did actually gain um, a small amount in terms of their executive function. Uh, and then if we look at other randomized controlled trials to see, well, does it actually change the onset of dementia or the incidence of dementia? Um, and there are fewer studies which have actually followed people for long enough and people who were at risk enough to actually develop dementia. And you can see that, um, for example, there are only three studies that have actually so far published results on dementia itself and about five studies on the risk of incident mild cognitive impairment. Um, and there is a trend toward, toward reduction of those um, factors, but not significant as of yet. So this is where the literature is not yet broad enough and strong enough to be able to say that we actually have proof from randomized controlled trials that we can prevent dementia. So we're still relying on epidemiology for a lot of those statements. And what we know from the studies that have been done so far is not a lot of them have actually looked at resistance training um, and or what we call anabolic exercise. And there is a, a large amount of underlying information that would suggest that in fact, it is important to look at anabolic exercise because if you take up this form of exercise, you actually can address many, if not all of the cardiometabolic risk factors that have been associated with dementia. So things like visceral obesity, insulin resistance, hypertension, high cholesterol, et cetera. Um, this is Dr. Jeffrey Life as an N of one study showing what happens when you take up weightlifting as a GP in midlife um, and transform your body and presumably his mind as well. So there is a huge rationale actually for resistance training in the promotion of cognitive health um, because it can take you from metabolic syndrome 
to metabolic fitness, take you from a catabolic or inflammatory profile to an anabolic or anti-inflammatory milieu. And that body composition change where you're increasing muscle and de decreasing fat has a very broad spectrum of improvements, uh, very basic things like increasing muscle strength and uh, aerobic capacity and balance, uh, but also uh, things that are in the metabolic realm like insulin resistance, hemoglobin A1C, uh, catabolism, visceral obesity. Um, and all of those things we know are related in some way or another to cognitive health. So there's a huge rationale for this kind of exercise which hasn't been fully explored in the literature. And in fact, in the earlier studies, uh, the benefits for cognition in aerobic exercise um, are not quite as great as the benefits when you combine aerobic and strength training. But up until this point in time, there hadn't really been any isolated studies of resistance training. So we don't really know how it would compare to um, aerobic training on its own. But since that time, there have been trials, very few of them, but a couple showing in a direct head-to-head -head comparison of resistance training and aerobic training in people with mild cognitive impairment. This is Teresa Louis Ambrose's Excel trial and looking here at executive function uh, via the Stroop test, uh, significant improvement with resistance training, um, no improvement significant with, uh, by comparison with the, either the control group or the aerobic training group. So very few trials have actually had this kind of head-to-head -head comparison, uh, but in this particular trial in this at-risk group, which we know is at much higher risk of developing dementia than people who are cognitively normal, uh, there certainly was a significant benefit for resistance training, which was linked to changes in their MRI scans or MRS scans in terms of um, functional uh, MRI uh, connections. So since, again, those, those early trials in resistance training, there have been a few more. This is a, a meta-analysis now looking at resistance training and its improvement in cognition um, in people with mild cognitive impairment. And you can see a significant benefit for executive function, uh, a not quite significant benefit for memory. And this is quite consistent across exercise trials. When you look at the various subdomains of cognition, there seems to be a stronger benefit for executive function than there does to be for memory. And often, in fact, memory doesn't change at all, but global function or executive function does change. So again, when we move a little bit farther down the spectrum of, of cognitive impairment all the way to dementia, in Patricia Haynes' meta-analysis here, we can see that the uh, benefit for exercise is, again, a sort of a moderate effect size. So remember, it was 0.12 in healthy people and we have a much larger effect size when you move down the spectrum to people with cognitive impairment and dementia. And again, in this particular analysis, no isolated PRT studies. These are generally studies of people who are getting some kind of combination of aerobic and resistance training, but certainly actually looks stronger in terms of an evidence base if you have some cognitive impairment to begin with than if you're cognitively uh, healthy. And again, that may be because of the ceiling effect of people who are cognitively uh, healthy to begin with. Sorry. Um, so there is evidence that it works. How does it work? Um, again, the question there is really unanswered. We do know that when the uh, muscles contract, they send messages to the brain uh, and the brain sends messages back to the muscle. Uh, we are not the first people to know this, obviously. This is a long-held phenomenon, but there is a strong, strong connection between muscle contraction, whether that muscle is contracting because of aerobic exercise or resistance training. Uh, it is very likely that some of those myokines that are secreted into the circulation actually cross the blood-brain barrier uh, and go into the brain. And one of them that people have been very interested in is IGF-1. Um, which is known to be um, higher in people who exercise, particularly with resistance training exercise. This is a study we did in Boston looking at the amount of IGF-1 and skeletal muscle in sedentary women, older women after 12 weeks of weightlifting exercise and healthy young men. And you can see that there's this very, very modifiable amount of IGF-1 that is expressed in skeletal muscle and then goes into the circulation after this form of exercise. And other studies have actually looked to see that after weightlifting exercise, there are increases in IGF-1 in the circulation, which are actually linked to the cognitive gains after that kind of exercise. So they were beginning to build up a bit of a database around that. Um, in a study we did several years ago called SMART, we were interested to see whether we could improve cognition with resistance training in people with MCI. In, and we were interested also in cognitive training, which is a very different way to train the brain and whether or not they were would be able to combine together and actually produce a very potent effect on the brain by attacking it, if you will, from two different 
uh, strategies. And in this study, we actually trained people for six months in our gym using weightlifting exercise, um, or we gave them cognitive training or both together or placebo versions of those kinds of interventions. And what we found was that there was a very potent effect of resistance training um, 12 months after we stopped the exercise. So at 18 months, after 12 months of no uh, intervention, there was still a very significant benefit for the brain. Um, and there actually was no significant benefit for the combined training compared to the control group. And cognitive training by itself was also no different than control. So in this study, just doing weightlifting exercise was actually the most potent way to attack the um, cognitive impairment in people with MCI. And we have followed these people for another uh, six years after this initial study, which we're now analyzing to see whether, again, there are long lasting benefits for this kind of exercise. How does it work? Well, we found that actually the people who gained the most strength also gained the most cognitive benefit from this intervention. And 64% of the benefit was mediated by strength gains, which again, tends to point to the fact that there is something about that anabolic adaptation in muscle, which is linked to the ana anabolic adaptation in the brain. And it's not that it makes you smarter because you're stronger, but there is something underlying those changes and whoever is able to gain the most um, anabolic adaptation seems to do the best cognitively after this kind of an intervention. Again, not going in opposite directions, people who have more muscle, more muscle strength, who gain more muscle strength after doing weightlifting exercise also gain the most cognitively. Uh, we're looking at that currently in other studies. Again, how does it work actually in the brain? Well, we were interested in a particular area of the brain called the posterior cingulate cortex, which is a very interesting area that uh, has something to do with emotion, empathy, forgiveness, awareness of self. It's one of the very first areas of the brain to actually go undergo atrophy, even before a clinical diagnosis of dementia is made, and even before you see hippocampal atrophy. So it's a very interesting area. Um, it's also associated with empathy. As I said, it's the only area of your brain that lights up. If I either show you a picture of somebody undergoing physical pain or emotional pain. Uh, and what did we see? Well, we actually saw that in our particular weightlifting study, this was the area of the brain that got larger when people did weightlifting exercise uh, compared to the sham exercise. And more importantly, the improvement in the size of this green area of the brain here was related to the improvement in cognition and global cognition. So it wasn't just an errant finding. Um, it seemed to be actually related to the cognitive benefits that we're seeing. Um, why that is, we don't actually know, but it does seem to work. And another very important structure or structural effect of, on the brain is what we call white matter hyperintensities, which as you know, are related to atherosclerosis. Uh, people who have hypertension and vascular abnormalities uh, systemically have lots of these white matter hyperintensities seen on MRI scan. And what we found was that after six months of weightlifting exercise, we could look at exactly how many pixels are lighting up here as white matter hyperintensities. And we see that the non-weightlifting groups actually had more and more white matter hyperintensities, even over just six months of follow-up. Um, and in the PRT groups, they actually had a decrease in the volume of white matter hyperintensities after six months. And you can see decreases in other interventions. Aerobic exercise will do this. Better control of hypertension and diabetes will do this. But weightlifting exercise also does it. So again, suggesting that there are very, very potent structural changes happening um, in the brain. So... <clears throat> So it's not a contradiction to think that you have to be either smart or brawny or strong. In fact, these two things seem to go together uh, and whether or not doing you know, multiple things at once, like you know, cognitive training while you're exercising, theoretically, that would seem to be a good thing to do. Our study did not show that it was beneficial, but certainly need to do more studies in that realm. So in summary about that, the evidence, certainly lots of epidemiological evidence that exercise is related to both fitness um, as well as physical activity levels. Uh, there do seem to be very potent effects of exercise on risk factors for metabolic um, and cognitive decline. Um, in some studies, particularly ones where people already have uh, some level of cognitive impairment, we see that there are benefits for both the aerobic training and strength training on those outcomes, but not all of the trials are positive to date. In terms of a mechanism, IGF-1 is probably the most consistently implicated uh, um, in both animal and human data, um, but certainly not in all trials that I've looked at it. Uh, there do seem to be dose response effects, um, but we don't know yet exactly what the most potent dose uh, response 
um, that you can get actually is and whether or not you can combine different modalities of exercise or, or exercise and other kinds of interventions is actually not clear from the data that we have to date. So the question really people want to know always is, well, what should I do? You know, there's a lot of evidence, not all of it is consistent, kind of seems to go in one direction, uh, but what really should I do? Um, I think based on what we know so far, certainly aerobic exercise, or if you're a child, physical activity in play seems to have lots of benefits in, in observational studies. Resistance exercise is supported really across the spectrum from healthy adults to dementia. Cognitively complex exercise, there are some benefits seen in some trials, but uh, the jury's still out. Even things like dual tasking, which seem to be quite uh, theoretically grounded in terms of how you stimulate the brain while exercising, as you see here, um, not a lot of benefit, not a lot of evidence yet that it's more beneficial than just doing exercise by itself, in fact. More of what we know is what not to do. And how do we know not to do this? Because these are the control groups in randomized controlled trials. These are the control groups, the gentle exercise class, stretching, toning, that kind of thing. That's what does not work. So unfortunately, in Australia, this is what most older adults get. So please don't do this because if you're interested in brain health, we know for a fact that these things do not work. Um, what about the dose? Well, if you look at the randomized controlled trials, it's very consistent, somewhere between three and seven days a week of aerobic exercise, two to three days a week of resistance training uh, is what seems to work reasonable sorts of volumes, 45 to 60 minutes per session. Um, but we do know that intensity matters because fitness outcomes seem to be proportional to intensity. Fitness outcomes are proportional to brain changes. Therefore, by logic, the highest intensity feasible in a given cohort would produce the highest adaptation uh, in the brain. So that's really what we recommend. And if you think about it across the lifespan, um, it becomes quite clear that it matters what you do from very early on. So there are now meta-analyses being published um, very, very frequently looking at what happens to uh, the baby in utero if the mother is encouraged to exercise, whether it's in animal models or human models. And it looks like um, having mothers exercise during pregnancy, particularly if they also are already obese or following a high fat diet, if it's an animal model, um, you can change the epigenetic modification of the baby's DNA in utero by what you have the mother do. Uh, and it also changes the gut microbiome in both the mother and the baby. So thinking about prevention, you're actually thinking about it from before birth, not actually just at the time of birth. Uh, and if you start then with pregnant women and babies in utero, prevention of gestational diabetes is probably number one. How do you do that? Well, pretty good evidence, aerobic exercise uh, and resistance training, both are beneficial in that regard. If you move on to preschool all the way up to puberty, um, maximizing school achievements is really important because cognitive reserve in terms of your educational level is very important for preventing cogn uh, cognitive decline, reducing screen time, sitting, having active play, aerobic exercise, preventing head trauma. We know that even one concussion is a risk factor for dementia. So thinking about exercise, but not to the extent that you would cause head trauma. In adolescence, very important to improve exercise, resistance exercise and aerobic. Again, preventing head trauma, preventing reducing screen time and sedentary behavior, because this is the time that group sport is often given away, particularly in girls. Uh, so a very important time for uh, maximizing that. Uh, if you move on to young adulthood, again, you're really thinking about educational achievement because that's when you're sort of at your peak in terms of educational acquisition and then preventing the um, onset of obesity, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and depression, which is, remember, a risk factor for um, dementia. Uh, and this is where we see a lot of it beginning to occur. Uh, in middle age, optimizing career development. It turns out that managers have less dementia than the workers that they supervise. So be a manager, be a boss if you can. Uh, you're less likely to develop, develop dementia. Uh, and again, preventing all of that cardiometabolic disease and reducing sedentary behavior. Uh, and in old age, which is where most of the people in your clinics perhaps are, are landing, optimizing social engagement, functional independence, preventing and treating all of those diseases that we know are related to dementia, but also our consequences of dementia. So sarcopenia, frailty, depression, malnutrition, all of those things will reduce the burden of functional dependency that might emanate from dementia. And how do you do that? Well, high intensity weightlifting, moderate intensity aerobic training, or more if feasible, and treating the caregiver and the patient diet. So the older you are, actually, the more important the resistance training component becomes because that's when sarcopenia, frailty, 
and other kinds of syndromes begin to um, rear their head. Uh, nicely enough, resistance training is possible in many different settings. You can do it in supervised settings. Uh, you can also do it uh, whether it's uh, triceps or other muscle groups in home settings. And so there are lots of ways that you can actually encourage this in your patients, even if they can't come into a supervised setting. Uh, always you want to remember the need for lifelong participation. If you stop doing it, it goes away. So thinking about things that people like to do into the very last decades of their life is really important. Uh, and if they can't run anymore, they can still hike, for example. So thinking about ways to kind of change up the intervention uh, or the treatment as people age. So going through the spectrum of cognition, then if people have normal cognition, you're trying to optimize their fitness and prevent risk factors for dementia. If they have subjective memory concern, like some of the people coming to your clinic, perhaps identify whether they have medical or psychological or the contributors to that memory concern. If they've already got mild cognitive impairment, trying to optimize their lifestyle, including diet and exercise, as well as treat both diseases and risk factors that they might have. And if they've already developed dementia, again, same thing as with mild cognitive impairment, but also now treating the family or the caregiver with education and support, which as we know, is one of the most potent ways to encourage aging in place and prevent transition to residential age care. So for the future directions, um, obviously we need to know more about the clinical relevance and sustainability of these changes. Uh, can we really prevent dementia? You know, we know we can from observational data, uh, it suggests that, but can we really do it in randomized controlled trials? How actually does it work? What is the right dose and intensity? Um, are there you know, differences between different kinds of exercise that we could tease out with direct head-to-head -head comparison studies? Uh, why do some people respond better than others? What are the individual genetic and epigenetic predictors of adaptation that we could sort out? Um, and what kinds of behavioral and, and uh, innovative technology can we use to actually ensure that people can do what we prescribe in unsupervised or remotely supervised session settings? Vicki and I are part of a large study called Maintain Your Brain, which is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and combined exercise, as well as psychological help uh, for people at risk for dementia. So that's an entirely online program, which we're now analyzing the final results of, um, which looks to try and do what we do in the clinic in a very remote um, setting. So uh, I think that's all I have. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Vicky and Maria. So I'm might just we have some questions through the Q&A so I just take some more minutes now to get through some of the questions with you. Um, one of the first questions came from Leon who was interested in um, the evidence around exercise in acute hospital settings so is there any evidence in acute hospital settings where less um, exercise is possible um, to that there is a quicker recovery for cognitive function even in people with underlying cognitive impairments? Um, absolutely. So the best studies are done by Michele Esquerdo, uh, one of my colleagues in Spain, and, and he's done um, several studies, one of which I'm a uh, collaborator on looking at people who are admitted to a geriatric uh, aged care ward um, and looking at actually acute, when they're admitted for things like pneumonia and, and, and many other conditions, uh, a lot of them had um, cognitive impairment as well as functional impairment, almost all of them. And with just a few days of exercise in the hospital, they actually had improvement in both cognition and functional outcomes. And the exercise was done by having them go downstairs to a, a gym that was set up in the hospital and they did weightlifting exercise, power training, as well as balance training, uh, two sessions a day for four or five days under supervision in the morning and by themselves at night. Um, and maybe only in Spain can you do this, I don't know, uh, but it actually worked. And you can look this study up in, in JAMA from a couple of years ago and they've got videos of the people doing the exercise. So you'll see they don't look like healthy people. They do look like old people in hospital but they're actually able to do this high intensity power training uh, while they're acutely admitted for another condition. So, um, so there is evidence. Um, and I think we with studies like that we absolutely need to replicate in Australia and other settings. Yes, thank you very much. Um, maybe related to that, um, do you think there's any, are there any, um, is there any evidence, any findings as well that relate to cognitive reserve and brain reserve and exercise? Um, are you aware of something like that? Adam is asking that. Um, in so in healthy adults, or are you talking about in? Uh, good question. Maybe Adam can <laughs> um, clarify on that. Um, is there? I think it's kind of relating to. Do you think there is a type of physical reserve as well um, 
them, not just kind of a cognitive reserve in some people. That's how I understand the question. Uh, physical reserve. Well, I mean, obviously people who exercise routinely are, are, have higher fitness levels, depending on what kind of exercise they do. So th those are some of the, you know, the studies that um, early on looked at people with higher um, fitness levels, uh, and those are related to either better cognition or higher brain volumes. Um, so clearly there, you know, there is that relationship and exactly what's driving it underneath. We don't really know yet, but um, certainly for a road, for anabolic exercise, some of those, uh, uh, the same factors that promote muscle growth and, and muscle cell growth promote neuron growth and synaptic growth. So very similar sort of pathways in terms of promoting um, anabolic adaptation in the brain and the body. Yeah, thank you. Um, another very practical question from Sharon Naismith um, that actually is to you, Maria, but I think it, I open it up for Maria and Vicky. Um, that is wondering about um, what memory clinicians or memory clinic clinicians should recommend to their patients in getting assisted with exercise started or getting started with a nutrition project uh, program just as well? Um, how can we help them to sustain um, being active and sustain keeping the diet? Um, do you have any advice on that? Vicky, you start. Well, look, I think it could be if able to send them to a, a dietitian who's very well you know, versed in these areas of Mediterranean diet, anti-inflammatory diets, where they have expertise and they can help an individual tailor it so that they can build gradually. But look, I think also we do increasingly need to be looking at online um, products and, and there is some good information out there and we, we're testing some, some types of interventions that can be delivered online that we can do as telehealth, that we can do as tech messages and that's part of you know what we're currently investigating and researching and how we do that well and engage people appropriately and and look that you know it is an area of expertise and so I think it is value in making sure that people are, are getting yeah you know, because there's a lot of confusing information out there I, I could also address a question that came up in the chat too not in the Q&A and it was around you know what about an older family member who wants to have the old biscuit I look, and, you know, and, and, you know, I think it's really important that people enjoy what they're eating. And so, you know, I, I would certainly not deny, you know, someone in their 70s, 80s, 90s, or even for ourselves, you know, the, you know we want to enjoy food. And I, I just said, I'm, I'm not sort of so hard lined that you would never have flour beyond biscuit, but, but I think it's just getting the overall balance there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I might just say if, if this is what Sharon was asking, if, if somebody is, is either cognitively intact or has mild cognitive impairment, um, perhaps, or just risk factors for cognitive impairment, I think you can probably give them semi-remote instructions and follow them semi-remotely. Once somebody has dementia or frailty or sarcopenia, or all three of the above, which is very, very common, I don't think you can treat them that way. I think you need to actually have supervised exercise that's done in a clinic setting at least initially, and then perhaps transfers to the home setting, it just doesn't work. And the, the kind of things that people tell people to do are nonsense. They are the control group of our randomized controlled trial. And we have to stop treating exercise as though it wasn't medicine. Um, it is medicine. It has a dose. It has a, a modality. It has an intensity. It has a way it works. And it has a whole bunch of placebo versions of itself. So don't give people placebo when they need real medicine. That's my message. And I think, you know, if you look at the gentle exercise classes in Australia, it's it's shocking. If you look at what happens in nursing homes in Australia, if there's any exercise, whatever it is, it's shocking. You know, and those, if anybody needs robust exercise, it's people in a nursing home. You know, they're dying for treatment of their sarcopenia and frailty and dementia, and we're giving them a placebo. It's not right. So I think we need to actually, the reason I always talk about the evidence before I give advice on what to do is the evidence matters, right? And I only do what the evidence says works. So if you don't know the evidence, you shouldn't be prescribing exercise and you certainly shouldn't be prescribing the things that are used as placebo control arms of randomized controlled trials. Yes, yeah. And yet now that you mentioned nursing homes as well, I was wondering also for the diet plans, um, how far and how far are those implemented in nursing homes? Yeah, look, it's a real challenge. And it's been identified in the Aged Care Royal Commission that we need to do a lot more work around nutrition in, in nursing homes. And of course, the challenge is the way the food is prepared and delivered, and it's not culturally appropriate. And there's all sorts of things about it, but really building in 
some great models around how we could be changing that that could all work and and yeah you know, there it's a, it's an area of expert area of dietetic profession to actually support nursing homes to deliver you know a, you know, a, a, a comprehensive nutrition context but also that it's culturally appropriate and that it's actually good food that's tasty and it often has to address things like dysphagia or something like that so so other more complex things that are happening for uh, people with aging who are aging and um it it's it's um really important that we work on this and and we and there's some some a couple of little examples of different you know, um, nursing home groups are starting to really pay attention to this, but we've got a long way to go in Australia in relation to this. Lots this of great there. material. The Maggie Beer Foundation. Yeah, I was just thinking about the Maggie Beer one. Their whole yeah. goal, and they now have a yeah. series of that you can purchase yeah. of modules that are they're not really. It's interesting because they're not about you know the nutrient content of the food. They're all about aesthetics. The food. How do you change the dining yeah. room? How do you put in things that smell good? How do you change appetite? How do you get people? Um, you know, to want to eat, to socialize. So it's all about eating in a in a aesthetically pleasing, you know, socially conducive way, which is a lot of what the Mediterranean diet talks about as well, eating in company, not yeah. eating alone. Um, so it, all of that has been stripped away from nursing homes and replaced by, you know, a dietitian who kind of puts out a plan of what the micronutrients are. But if no one's eating it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, you know? it's, it's got to be fundamentally based on the food and, and yeah. That a lot more work needs to be done in that area. Human Care is also doing quite a bit of work in this space. So there, there's a, 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 a smattering of nursing homes are really actively looking at this area. Mm. Picking up. Maybe in the interest of time, I just ask one last question. And if any of your questions are not answered, please uh, don't hesitate to contact the speakers directly or contact us and we forward the questions to the speakers that haven't been answered in the last minutes now. Um, but one last question that was asked here is um, if there's any studies, actually, we talked in your, your studies talked a lot about um, particular reducing vascular risk factors. Um, have there been any studies looking at outcomes for exercise or again, I would like to open that up for nutrition as well in individuals who are genetically predisposed for dementia? Um, yeah, I mean, there are some studies which have looked at whether or not exercise adaptations are uh, cognitive adaptations are seen in people depending on their APOE4 status, for example. Um, and there, there aren't that many. We're actually looking at that ourselves now, but it does look like it works at least as well, if not better, in people who are at risk because of at least APOE genotype. Um, and certainly if you look at, um, you know, whether somebody has the risk factors of uh, hyperinsulinemia or hypertension, you know, exercise tends to work more potently in people who have abnormal risk factors as opposed to people who are, you know, not so afflicted. So no evidence that it doesn't work if you're genetically more at risk, I would say. Yeah, I know in that pre-med study, that spin-off from the pre-med study, they did take into account APOE status and they found that it was as effective in that grouping as well. So that was a similar observation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm just quickly sharing my slides again. Thank you very much for all the insights. As I said, please get in touch again with the speakers. Um, if you have any more burning questions or discussion points, there's lots of discussions, particularly around the nursing home um, area I feel here going on. Um, at the end of today's webinar, I just want to remind you that at the end, you can leave us some feedback um, if you close your um, window here many of you have already um you please leave us some feedback um give us some suggestions for other topics that you're interested in in the upcoming webinar series for 2023 all the slots for this year are closed already and our next webinar is in august 2022 and will be around anxiety and depression in dementia um so we will be sending emails with invitations around as usual so please watch that space. And as I said before, you can rewatch all the webinars that we had already on the AdNet website. Thank you very much, Maria and Vicky, for this excellent um, presentation. Um, there are also guidelines out that also pick up some of the um, advice um, that you mentioned around exercise and including dietitians, including exercise physiologists in the assessment, in the care plan implementation. So have a look at the memory clinic guidelines as well. Thank you very much for all your time. Contact us for any more questions. Um, and we're very much looking forward to welcoming you to the next webinar in August. Thank you very much.